Bible. So turn with me to the book of Revelation. While I have you, I do need to make an announcement, and for the members, I need you to vote on something. Now, I know this is a little unusual, but we normally do, according to our church constitution, something called a nominating committee. And what we do is uh, each year we vote on every position in the church. Well, with everything that has been crazy, we're running at about 50% of our, our, our staffing. There's a lot of our preschool, and that's not been back. So what we're trying to say is this. If you folks, what we'd like to do is just whoever was working in whatever position last year, if you would just continue to do that. Now, for some reason, there's a few of you that already came up and said, hey, Pastor, I have to go off because of this. I know uh, Roy Parson has a health issue. And uh, if you can't do it, all I need you to do is come see me or text me, okay? That's all you need to do. But per the Constitution, I just need a, a nomination from, or a, a, what do you call that thing? A motion. Yeah, that's good, Teresa. From you guys to say, hey, listen, we're going to go ahead and just uh, let all the positions stay from the previous year, okay? Because it's so hard to have a meeting when I have two different services, okay? So do I have a motion and I have a first by? Way to back, Chuck. I got a second by my brother, Jeff. All in favor, say aye. All opposed, like sign. You guys are all good Republicans and Democrats. Okay, so that is passed and we're in good shape. So with all that being other said, I'm gonna hold off on the other announcements. I'll make up at the end when you're exiting. How's that sound, okay? Turn with me to the book of Revelation. And hopefully, you know, I, I was so, with looking at the scripture this week, I was so thinking about this, thinking, you know, this is like the Gospels in the sense that this is Jesus' direct words. Now, I know all scripture is given by inspiration of God. So whatever the apostle Paul wrote and whatever Peter wrote and whatever Jude wrote, okay, it's the word of God. But I'm just saying that, man, for this book to be written, and these are Jesus' direct words to the church, it speaks volumes. And so we really need to pay attention to what's going on. Now, we've been learning about the seven churches, all right? And the seven churches, I told you that one church probably was the church that started them all. What church was that? Ephesus. Uh, Ephesus Baptist Church, I think it was called, all right? And so Ephesus was the founding church. And tell me who the three pastors were that were at that church. I heard uh, in the back, uh, Shannon Sullivan say Billy Graham. No, that's incorrect. It wasn't Billy Graham. No, I, her husband got it right. Thank God she married him. Anyway, it was Jane, uh, James. It was John, Paul. There you go, okay. And actually Timothy. So there were actually four, all right? The church at Ephesus was a church that lost their first love. They, they still loved God, but they had an issue which basically he wasn't top on their list. We looked at last week called a church at Smyrna. And church at Smyrna was the what church? Persecuted church. Good job. Guys, today we're looking at the church called Pergamos. Now, you've got to understand Pergamos real quick. If you would have went to Ephesus back in its day, it was the New York City of its time. Okay? I don't know. Anybody ever been downtown New York City? Times Square. I mean, there's playhouses. I mean, I know we have this what, playhouse district and all this and state theater, but you get to New York, okay? It's a totally different realm, all right? This Ephesus was the cultural center, okay, of all these cities. But when you got to Pergamos, it was the political, okay, next, at this time, next to Rome, okay? It was the major part of the empire because they end up getting this because back when Rome, before it became an empire, before it became Caesar and, and ran by a god, it was a republic ran by basically senators that were elected. And at that time, there was this guy that was in Turkey that basically sit there in this game. You don't need to remember his name, but it was Annalus. And Annalus sit there and said, hey, you know what? I'm getting ready to die. I'm the third king, and I'm just going to give the Roman Republic all this territory. And what it did, it opened Rome from all the way from Italy all the way into Asia. Okay? So it's very important. 
Pergamus was a city that had political. It was the D.C. of that day, okay? It was, it was where the, the, that main powerhouse was at. It also was a place that was full of different religions, all right? Many of you, that, any of you guys that are in the medical field, you always see the what with the medicine, the snake, remember? All right? What are their gods? Dedicated to that. They had Zeus there. They had Diane there. And of course, on top of all that all, they had um, Caesar worship. So this is Pergamus. Pergamus is a city. And there's an important description that I want you to see concerning this city. Now, first thing that I want you to mention is that first of all, and I want to skip this slide, here's the seven churches. Now remember, he's on the island of Patmos, all right? Been exiled there by the Caesar Domitian. Domitian. Remember, all the Caesars got called, but their first name was Caesar. Okay, it was their it was their it was their title, like president. Now, with that in mind, third prominent city in Asia, okay, was competing for the title of first of Asia. Located 50 miles, okay, north of Smyrna, an important city of commerce, capital of the Mysia region. Real quick, also, had a library. They say, <laughs> well, so what? My brother never read. <laughs> it had a library. In this library, 200,000 books. Now, you know, I say, well, oh, that ain't so impressive. Go to Morley. They've got 20, and at least 19 are colored in. No, no, no. This is a, a, a city that had 20,000. You got to understand, they didn't have like regular books we had. They had parchments, all right? This was the biggest collection of library next to Alexandra, Egypt. So it was considered an education capital, all right? It was the O-H-I-O, -O, okay? It was, it, was, no, it was the Yale, it was the Harvard, very educated, extensive in this community. It was credited with inventing parchment. You say, what in the world is parchment? That's what they wrote things down on, all right? All right, it was prominent in medicine and in healing. With that in mind, what else do we know? It was a judicial city, all right? Here comes a judge. Here comes a judge. So it was one of the ones that you would go, and it was like going to the Supreme Court before you went to Caesar, all right? And they regularly held court there. Christians would have faced peril daily. And we're going to talk about that in a minute. Also, idolatry emperor worship was very widespread, and in the midst of this, we find the Church of Christ. So with all that being said and done, let's take the text and let's see what God has to tell us. And we're going to take this verse by verse. And notice he says this in verse, starting in verse 12. He says, to the angel of the church in Pergamos, he says, write. Notice what he says here. He says, I know. Remember, Jesus says that all the time. He says, I know. I know your works. And I remind you that Jesus is walking through what? While he's sitting there and talking to these churches, what is he walking? What is he doing? He's walking by something. The lampstands. Good job. And those represent the what? The churches. So he knows our circumstances. And so he's sitting there saying, listen, guys, it's not like I'm snoozing here, okay? I know what you are personally going through because this church is going through some things. It's interesting when he talks to this. I know your works. He says, the things saith he, and to the angel of the church, real quick, back in verse 12 of Pergamus right, these things say, he who has the sharp two-edged sword. Now, I want you to look at that verse and think about this. This sharp two-edged sword, first of all, is first mentioned in the book of Revelation when, remember, he gives descriptions to all the churches. And in this, the sharp two-edged was a dagger, and it wasn't the big sword that you think that the Roman soldiers carry. It was the one for close hand-to-hand -hand combat when you're in there to basically stab. This verse reminds us of very important that, first of all, it is a sharp two-edged sword, and I'm reminded of what Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12 says this. And it's very important, guys, listen to this. It says, for the word of God, it's living, okay? It's living, okay? It's active. 
It's not dead. It's when the Word of God should be actively working in our lives. It says it's sharper than any double-edged sword. The idea of a double-edged sword was it could sit there and go in each way and sit there and pierce. It penetrated even to the dividing of the soul and spirit. It's joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. So the first thing he comes out and he says, listen, I know I know your works, but he says, I know every bit about you. I know what your thoughts are. I know what your motives are. I know what your actions are. You know what? That amazes me because what it tells me is sometimes, can you talk yourself into think that you're doing the thing the right way, but maybe there's a little bit of your own uh, kind of hand in the kitty a little bit. You know what I'm saying? Oh, God would want me to do this, but does God really want you to do it? Point of his verses, it's teaching us that every thought, motive, and action, God knows. God knows exactly what you're doing and what the reason is. Oh, yeah, there might be some other people saying, man, I'll tell you what, he's doing a great job on this, 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 this. But you know what? God knows, okay, every bit about what we're doing. And so he's sitting there and saying, listen, I know your guys' situation. I know you've got a tough situation going on. And matter of fact, he describes it even more in this verse because then he says, I know your works, and I know where you dwell. He says, listen, I know you're in the hood. You see what he's talking about? He knows that their situation is a lot harder than the average person in some of the other cities. Because where they live, a specific word here is mentioned. Notice this. Look at this word, guys. It's where Satan's throne is. See that? Where Satan's throne is. He's saying, listen, I know where you dwell. And where you dwell, Satan's got his main headquarters. See, folks, you've got to remember this. Satan is not sitting there, and he's not sitting there. When, when we were growing up, we had like 13 or 14 buses that would go out from Faith Baptist Church in Perry. Okay? And each of the buses would have... They would have Mickey Mouse. I don't remember this, Larry, back in the old days. Had Mickey Mouse. That way, people like uh, that were in high school, like my brother, could find his bus. You know? <laughs> anyway, they would have Mickey Mouse. They would have Donald Duck. No, seriously, that way the preschool kids would come out of the class and go, "It's my bus," you know? Because it was. I mean, we were averaging uh, uh, one one year. We had like a uh, one week. We had like a thousand fifty-five. I mean, just all kids all over. You know, you hopefully get the right kids to the right place. You know. But with all this being said and done, I remember my brother one year had picket signs. The pastor put him up to it. And he dressed in this red devil outfit. And he sat there and stood in front of the church and had picket signs saying, this church has hard cues. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Don't come to this church. It's a Bible-believing church. You know what I'm saying? Many people get the idea that Satan is dressed in red. He's got pitchfork, okay? And uh, basically, he's got a beard, kind of like that brother over there. And, and that basically, he is, you know, he, he, he's in hell. Satan is not in hell. Satan is alive and well on the planet Earth. Satan is not God. I don't care what you guys, you've got to get to understand this. Satan is not omnipresent. And what do I mean by that? He can't be here at the same time when he's in New York City. He has to be in one place at one time. God is everywhere. Not only is God omnipresent, he's everywhere, but he's omniscient. He knows everything. Satan does not know everything, okay? Now, before you start with that, he still is a bit better equipped to handle you, you know? I used to love these preachers. Oh, I'll give Satan a big black eye! Yeah, you're an idiot, okay? Because you better be walking in the spirit or you're going to get hit hard, fast, and continuously, okay? So the teaching here is where Satan dwells. This is Satan's, right now, where Satan is dwelling. You go into the Greek, it's actually saying this is his hometown right now, all right? Some of you may say, man, I'll tell you, it might be his hometown, but today, man, it's definitely over at my house at 4811 River Road. <laughs> Sometimes you may feel that way. But he right now is dwelling in Pergamos. Now, with this, I want you to see this teaching here. It then says, 
I know your works. I know where you dwell. And Satan's throne is. And it says, but you hold fast to my name. He says, listen, I know it's bad. I know you, you're in the political capital of this area. I know that there is a lot of pressure on you. I know that there is gods to everything. Now, you can't swing a cat. Not like you should swing a cat. But you can't swing anything without hitting, all right, some god to something. And then you got the pressure because you have to bow to them. But says, even in the days in which Antipas, my faith, uh, faithful martyr who was killed among you where Satan dwells. Well, who is Antipas? Antipas, go back in time. Folks, the Bible is a number you should be reading. But, hear, hear me out. If you ever want to be challenged, the next book I would recommend you read that all Christians should read is the Fox Book of Martyrs. Now, do not pick up the copy that was in the early, because it was written first in around the 1700s. So it's, thus saith, he got stabbed. By the, <laughs> so you don't want to get the old copy with the old English, okay? But you get the updated, which is available on Amazon. And it tells a story of the Christian martyrs all the way from the apostles, all the way up currently to the 1950s, 1960s, and all the way even to what's happening in Nigeria right now. So it was updated till about 197 or 2017 currently. But the Fox Book of Martyrs, the original writing, went to about the 1700s, and it traced martyrs in the Bible. Antipas was a man that sit there and boldly would not back down in the area where, where Satan dwelled. So what they did is they took him... And at that time, they put him in a giant bull. And basically, they boiled him alive. The bull itself had nostrils. And when they sit there and they burned you, it was almost like a tea kettle. Because it would sit there and make the noise of a bull coming out, snorting. Okay? And that's how Antipas died. Okay? according to the early church fathers that witnessed it. This, he's saying, listen, I know you got something tough. You, you in a bad area, okay? I got it, all right? And I know you hold fast to my name. In other words, you ain't ashamed of it. But he says, and you did not deny my faith. He says, you didn't sit there and cover it up. You didn't hide your, 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 your light under a bushel. You didn't say, hi, I'm a... You still proclaimed me. But he says, even in the days, he says, things are getting rough for you. I know that. You know, right now, God knows it's getting rough for you in your life. God knows your situation where you are having a little bit of trouble. God knows that circumstance that maybe no one else knows, that heartbreak right now that you're sitting there and you're just holding it yourself and you're sitting there saying... Oh, I, I don't know. Let me tell you this morning, there's hope. Let me tell you this morning, the Bible says, cast your cares upon him, for he careth for you. I love that Hebrews 4, verse 12, but verse 15 and Hebrews 4, 15, it says, you have a high priest, which was touched in all points like we are. What's that mean? Jesus knows what you felt like. Jesus been there. He understands your circumstances. Now, with that in mind, he says, but I have a few things against you. No. <laughs> this was my list. I'd be saying, you don't do it pretty good. <laughs> you know? You know? People are getting killed around you. You know? That a boy. They're, they're probably getting pretty good on my rating. But God tells us something very important here, and I think that we need to understand this. And, and I, I want to talk to you specifically about this area. When, in this culture, okay, Satan was controlling the shots in the political. You know, folks, if God is not giving the guidelines for our government, man who wants to be God will. Don't ever forget that. There is always man that is trying to usurp himself to be God, and he will fill that vacuum. It's been done throughout the ages, all right? 
It's been done through the 20th century with Germany, with, with Mao, with, with Stalin, okay? And today, you see it with all the different things that are coming in with people saying, you know what? Really, the government is here to help you and the government, but there basically comes up an elite society. Notice he says, you have those that who hold the doctrine of Balaam. Okay? He's saying, listen, y'all doing good, but you know what? I got something against you. Because y'all hold the doctrine of Balaam. You say, what in the world's the doctrine of Balaam? You got to go all the way back to Numbers 22 through 25. Now I'm going to give you the short story. You ready for it? Okay. Two guys. You got Balaam, who's a prophet. All right? And you got Balak who's the king of the Moabites. So you got Balak, who's the king of the Moabites, and you got Balaam. Well, Israel is just coming through. They are stomping every nation. Everyone's hearing about it. Fear has came because Egypt, that was the powerhouse at that day, has been totally wiped out. So what ends up happening is ba Balak sits there and says, please, Balaam, listen. Balak. listen. You got to go curse these Israelites for me. They're stopped. There ain't nothing we got. We don't have any military. We have a military, but they ain't gonna be able to stop these guys. So you know, Balaam sits there and says, "Well, how much you offering?" The guy sits there and says, so, "I'm going." So he gets on a donkey. The first mention of a jackass in the Bible in the King James version. Okay, all right. First Democrat ever met. No, I'm kidding. And anyway, at this point, he gets on the donkey and. And he starts going, and the Bible says that all of a sudden the donkey sits there and goes to the right. Republican. No, I'm kidding. And he goes to the right and smashes Balaam and the donkey, and he sits there and he starts kicking a donkey, and the donkey just sits there and goes, kind of like how you guys give me stares during the service. So at that point, he gets the donkey to start going, the donkey sits there and goes to the left, it crushes his other leg. He's just beating that thing. He just like, go, donkey, go, go. And finally, the donkey starts going a little bit. At this point, the donkey sits down. This is in Numbers 22. And Balaam gets mad. He starts cussing at the thing. Oh, don't act no more holier than thou, like you never got mad at something in your life, you know? And he's sitting there kicking this thing, and he's beating this thing. And the donkey, the Bible says, speaks to him. Now, some of you, that was a miracle in itself. But you all forget one thing, too. In Genesis, everybody forgets when Eve sinned first, a serpent talked to her. It wasn't like she was, wow, man, a serpent just talked to me. Back at that time, I'm just saying back in the, that time, in Genesis, man had the ability to communicate with animals. Don't tell me how, but they did. Because you never sit there and say, Eve was shocked by Ruth talking to a serpent. But by this time, Balaam was shocked. I don't know what he did. All I know is he was taken back. And the Bible says that an eyes were open and he saw an angel down there that was ready to cut Balaam's head off because he wouldn't listen to the Lord. So Balaam comes back and says, Balaam, you got to curse him. You said you would. I can't do it. Every time I try to do something, the Greyhound bus don't work. <laughs> I can't get a flight. It's COVID. I can't come to you. It ain't working. He says, what am I supposed to do? He says, listen, I can't curse God's people. God just sits there and keeps circumventing. But this is what you do. He says, you get them you got some pretty girls in your old uh, kingdom. You kind of sit there and let them blink their eyes a little bit. Kind of just love up on the Jewish guys and God's people. You just sit there and get them to compromise. And you know, you just sit there and introduce to them a few other gods. You know what I'm talking about? You know, you know just, just introduce a little bit. So that what Balaam suggested worked. Because he said, listen, I can't get God to curse his people, or I can't curse God's people. But you know what you can do? You can get God's people to sin, and God will do what I couldn't do. 
So what he did was he got the nation of Israel to intermarry with his people, worship their gods, and at that time, God sat there and said, you know what? I'm against you, Israel, because you've broken my covenant with you. The point of it is this. God cannot bless compromise. Now, let's talk about this real quick. We know, first of all, compromise is not a bad word, okay? I compromise with my wife all the time. She tells me what to do, when to do it. Yes, ma'am, yes, dear. Seem reasonable to you men? That is compromise. Okay, amen, I get it, Jeff, I, I get it. You know, you know what, what is it, happy life, you know? <laughs> happy wife, you know what I'm saying? You know, instead of a black eye for the guy. I mean, it's, it's a bad way. You know, compromise is good. It would be good if, to see if sometimes that the Republicans and Democrats could compromise on certain things to sit there and do what's best for the nation instead of their own agendas, okay? But when it comes to compromising the word of God and it comes to compromising the doctrine and it also comes and you say, well, this ain't that big of a deal to compromise. Yes, it is. Because many of us will compromise in small areas. We don't think it's that big of a deal. It may be, you know what? Eh. I pay the government enough. They don't need to know about those other things that I do. Okay? You're forgetting. You're owned by God. And many times we start compromising. We'll sit there and say, you know, that program ain't so bad. Okay, there's just a little bit of nudity. All right? That, 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 that Facebook thing isn't so bad. I don't mind sitting there and seeing some of those things. And we start compromising in small things. But God sits there and says, you know what? I can't have that. Now, wait a minute. Some of these guys, Antipas died. Now, I guarantee you, he wasn't compromising. But the teaching is here in these verses is, is basically they sit there and they held to Balaam. I have a few things because those who hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel. He says, I got a problem with that. He then sits there and says, this is very important. Compromise will keep God's word from cutting anything in your life. The two-edged sword that we speak of also refers to cutting things that open up doors in your life. It's an interesting interpretation in the word of God. Many times you sit there and say, man, I don't know why I'm not getting this from God. I'm not, you know, because there's sin in the camp. All right? Now, another thing that he sits there and says in the next verse, and I want you to see this, verse 15. Thus you also have those who hold the doctrine of the Nickelodeons, which I hate. What's his point here? Now, this is not Nick at night, okay, for you Nickelodeon uh, geeks, all right? What this is referring to is this. The doctrine of the Nickelodeons, which I told you was also held by Ephesus, Ephesus would not sit there, the church at Ephesus would not tolerate it. The church at Pergamos said, how you doing, brother? So they tolerated this teaching, which basically was a teaching of Balaam, of compromise. And, Paul, and in this word, it's something interesting. The word here, and I want you to catch this word. He's saying, some of you folks are actually compromising. Talking about the first verse with Balaam. Then in the second verse where he's talking about, though, you also have those who hold the die. He said, listen, I know some of you ain't compromising in your individual lives, but you're tolerating people in your church that do. Ooh. Can't we all just get along? We don't believe. You know, you can't judge me. You're, you're not allowed to judge me. How can you say that? That's the words that are today. Don't you hear that? Judge not that you might not be judged. People sit there and say, oh, you can't, you can't judge us. You know what? The Bible tells us very specifically. Okay. God says this is a big issue. Folks, you cannot, you, you can sit there and judge folks' doctrine. You can judge, actually, you may not be able to judge folks' uh, their, 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 their methods sometimes, but you know what? You can judge 
what they're doing if it's in a line with the Word of God. And he's saying, listen, I know you got some folks that it's in your camp, you're allowing to continue. And he then sits there and says, listen, repent. The word repent is a Greek word which means menanoia. Now, you'll hear a lot of people say different things saying, listen, menanoia is just basically changing your mind that Jesus is God. Yes, it is. But it also has a thing that when you change your mind, you are also supposed to go into a different direction of obedience. So he said, listen, not only do I want you to understand this is right, I want you to do it. Many of you guys and many of me sometimes will sit there and we'll hear something and we'll say, yeah, that sounds good. But we don't do anything about it. He's saying, listen, I need you to repent. I need you not only to know it, but I need you to change what you're doing. Notice what else that happens in this text. He then says, and this is the point, job, uh, job is not trying to make yourself or people in your spiritual influence comfortable in their compromise. Sometimes we'll sit there and say, you know, it's okay that you're doing that. Folks, it's not okay to be living together, okay, when you're not husband and wife. It's not okay. You can sit there and say, oh, it's a society. I don't care. It's what the Bible says. You, you can sit there and say, you know what, I, 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 I think it's okay for us to sit there and say homosexuality is okay. No, it's not okay. All right? It's wrong for the word of God. Does God still love you on all this stuff? Yes. Well, you know what, it's okay to sit there and, and you know, uh, cheat on my taxes. It's okay to sit there and, you know what, maybe lie and, and, and kind of distort the truth and maybe not... Not say, no, the Bible says all this is wrong. See, the thing is, is folks, we like to categorize sin. God sits there and says we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. So this morning the question is, what are you, what are you and I compromising in? Every one of us. Because this message is to the pastor too here. This pastor, it was written to the pastor at this church. Now, real quick, he does something else which I really like. He says this, he who has an ear. Okay? Once again, this is an individual. This is going to an individual saying, listen, who has an ear? All right? He's saying, I don't care what everybody else does. I don't care what all these other people are doing. It doesn't matter to me. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes. Now, I told you this word, he uses this to all the seven churches. Why? Because this word overcomes, the Bible says that every one of you that know Jesus Christ is your Savior, you are an overcomer. Positionally. You've been equipped, the Bible says, with everything you need to live a Christian life and to have victory in your life over any sin that comes against you. But, many of us, although we're positional, we're not practicing it. Okay? And that's what he's talking about. He gives a special thing here to who he that overcomes, to he that sits there and says, I'm not going to compromise. Remember I told you two weeks ago when we had that Labor Day sermon. If you're saved, you're a son and daughter of Jesus Christ. But many of us are not in the will of Jesus Christ. What do you, what do you say about that? Now, I'm not talking about the will of not only just us living for him, I'm talking about an actual will which God sits there and promises special blessings in the kingdom. You and I cannot not sit there and say that there are not specific rewards. The Bible speaks of rewards extensively, not only here on earth. Many times when you and I compromise, we cut off because God will not bless a mess we will not receive those spiritual blessings of Ephesians 1.3, which talks about you and I have them. God has them reserved to bring them into your life, but you can't get them because you are cut off from it. Not because of God, but because of your own choices. But that also works in the heavenly realm. And he's sitting there saying, listen, you that overcomes are going to have a special blessing that is going to be different from all the other folks that's in heaven. This is important for you to understand. Okay? Not everybody's going to get a soccer ball in heaven. Not everybody gets the trophy. Okay? All right? 
The soccer moms will be upset. But the teaching of the Word of God says there are special blessings that only come to those that sit there and what do what Jesus says. And then notice what he says here. He says two things. Now, some of you are going to sit there and say, well, I don't care. I don't want that thing anyway. But I want you to look at what he says. He says, to them, I will give some of them the hidden manna to eat. Now, you some of you see us saying, listen, my, my, my stomach's full. <laughs> what do I want to eat this little hidden manna for? That was heavenly food. What is that specific? The word hidden man is an interesting word because it actually in this text refers to that you are going to have specific time with Jesus. You say, well, we're all going to see Jesus. No. In the kingdom. Folks, I know you all, uh, there's some folks that are retired. Guess what? You're not retired in the kingdom period. See, work is not, okay, a curse. Everybody thinks, man, Adam and Eve sinned and work's a curse. No. They worked during the Garden of Eden before. Okay? You will have a job in the Millennium Kingdom. You will. You're going to be assigned. But he's saying in this verse that some of you are going to have a special that God, that you're going to have more time with Jesus Christ because you've overcome in this world the reason of compromise. Then he sits there and he says, listen, I'm going to give you a white stone. Some of you are saying, well, what's a white stone? Well, you break a window with that? I mean, what do you do with that? In Roman times, the white stone was given to people that would go to special events thrown by the political government. These white stones, they were hard. People would try to buy them from people, but they were given. This was like an extreme. This was like a major ticket to an event. And you had to be the elite to get that, to go into in presence. Okay? The idea is that this white stone is the same thing. That you and I, and he says it's going to be a special name on it. I don't, you know, a different name will be on this stone. And this stone is going to get you access in heaven, okay, where some people will not have access. You say, well, listen, that's not fair. That's the first thing you're going, I, I'm going to hear. That ain't fair. Folks, we our thinking is all screwed up, okay? You better get rid of the fairness. You better get rid, you know, we're 6% of the world, okay? The United States is 6% of the world, Okay? The problem is we sit there and try to, and that's why we sit there and try to promote democracy all the way across the world. Don't get me wrong. I, I, I praise the Lord for our troops, but you ain't, democracy ain't going to work in Iraq, okay? They think differently, okay? You can't just sit there and legislate our American dream to every place in the world because they just don't buy it, all right? But in, and, and sometimes we get this idea that, oh, there's got to be equity and fairness. There is equity and fairness. But the point of it is, you earn it. The Bible says you are predestinated unto good works. Do you hear me that? So you don't hear a lot about this. You sit there and hear, well, we're all saved. We're all going to heaven. Yes, you are. You get the white robe of righteousness. You're in. But you would have to mutilate Scripture from the Gospels of Jesus including the book of Revelation, including the book of James, including the book of 1 Peter, including Timothy, because it talks about rewards, rewards, rewards. So folks, he's saying to me, he's saying, listen, if you want something a little more better in this life also, if you want to sit there and see your circumstances change, if you're up against a wall and you're sitting there saying, I can't come past this, the question you need to ask, you can go to church as much as you want. You can pray as much as you want. You can do Bible study as much as you want. But if there is sin in the camp and there's compromise in it, God's saying, listen, I'm not going to cut that stuff out. I'm not going to open up the doors. So folks, you and I got to remember that. When we seek to please God, God is not a God that is a God that sits there and says, I'm good with second. I'm good with third place. Hey, fourth's okay with me. I know you're a busy man. God's saying, listen, I'm Uno. Ain't no other God beside me. And that's what the teaching is to the church of Pergamos. So let's close in prayer. Father in heaven, I thank you for this time. I thank you for these folks. 
And Father, Lord, there's been a challenge here. And there are some folks here that may have no issue with compromise. I get it. But Father, I was thinking to myself, I did. God, each day I beg you from Romans 12, 1 and 2 that, that I present my life as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable, which is your reasonable service. And you say, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of our mind so that we could prove what is good and the perfect will of our Father. God, I'm asking that you open up doors in our lives, Father, Lord, that we can become more like you. This life really is just learning to love you in the next. And Father, Lord, we miss out. I, I know one day, I'm going to stand before you and there is a judgment seat of Christ and it's a judgment of rewards. Every Christian will stand there. And I'm going to see things that I missed. I'm going to see things that I've done wrong because I did it for the wrong motives. Oh God, I, I just pray for the time I have and for the time these folks have, whatever time you've given us, whether you've given us 40 years of life or whether you've given us one that we seize the day. Because it doesn't matter, Lord, what we've done in the past. It matters how we finish the race. And that's the beautiful thing about you. There is forgiveness in the name of Jesus Christ. So this morning we come to you and we ask for that. And Father, we thank you for this time we have together. We ask this in Jesus' name.